My world was rocked when my dad called me to tell me that he'd just been diagnosed with cancer and his prognosis was grim. What he needed, he said, was a miracle. Now, while he was in treatment, my mum called me to let me know she'd just been diagnosed with cancer. She too needed a miracle. I was so stunned, I couldn't believe it. I just kept saying, no, how can this be? Both parents needing a miracle at the same time? But do miracles really exist? And if they do, how do we get one? And what happens if our miracle, well, what if it doesn't arrive in time? The greatest artists in history, they've also struggled with these exact questions. Today, we'll learn what they had to say about the mystery of miracles. In the process, I'll try to make sense of what happened to my own mum and dad. But let's begin with a strange painting by a rather obscure artist. Come with me. When I first saw this painting in the Tate Gallery, it stopped me in my tracks. It's a scene that encapsulates so much drama, tension, hope and mystery. It explores one of the most graphic and traumatic emotional moments any human can experience. The painting holds a secret and it also raises intriguing questions. Questions I've been asking myself and possibly they're questions you've been asking too. And it's because they go to the core of what it means to be a human. This painting was created by Henry Thompson in 1820. In fact, it was his first religious painting. Thompson lived a fascinating life. Due to his interest in art, his father took him to live in Paris. But sadly, after two years, the French Revolution broke out. So the Thompsons beat a hasty retreat to England. Later, he lived in Italy, Germany and Austria. But Thompson became a very well-respected member of the British art community. Furthermore, he had the honour of being elected as the keeper of the Royal Academy of Arts soon after painting this dramatic scene. The title is The Raising of Jairus' Daughter. It tells the biblical story of Jesus entering the home of Jairus who was a leader in the Jewish synagogue. And Jesus entered this home to bring new life to Jairus' 12-year-old daughter. In this scene, the young girl is limp, pale. Life's drained from her. The reason? Well, it's simple. She's dead. And she's dressed in grave clothes, ready for the tomb. The Bible states that when Jesus entered this home, the onlookers laughed him to scorn. But notice what Thompson has done with this story. Firstly, we see Jairus, who is kneeling beside the head of his daughter. His hands are clasped, praying to God for a miracle. At the head of the bed are attendants, or possibly their family members, and they're propping up a pillow and looking on intently. At the rear of the painting is Peter, James and John. They're wondering what's going to happen. Jesus takes the limp hand of the girl and he raises his arm as a symbol of the miraculous power within the name of God. I want you to take a look at a mother. Her mother is reaching forward in desperation. She's hoping upon hope for the impossible. We can see on her face her intense concern, pure devotion, and a hint of optimism balanced against desperate grief. Beside her is another man. He looks on with unrestrained wonder. Could this child begin breathing again? Will warmth come back to her cold body? Will breath fill her lungs again? 
Will her limp body animate with the spark of life? How did the spirit of life leave her? Where did it go? And how could it return? This is not quite the time for smiling or celebrating or even thanking. The painting captures the desperate anticipation, but not yet the fulfilled promise of the resurrection. It's a bit like a chemist who's compiled a precise formula, but isn't certain yet if it'll work. He looks over a scene he can't control. His eyes seem to say, will it happen? Is this some kind of trick? Will it last? And how do I make sense of any of this? Now, maybe I read that into his expression, because those are exactly the questions I've been asking myself. My questions start with my own mum and dad. Like many kids who grew up in the 70s, my parents divorced, both got remarried, and I bounced between them. Now, divorce is pretty common today. We shrug it away as a routine rite of passage. But when it's your parents, I can tell you, there's nothing routine about it. Some psychologists say divorce is harder on kids than the death of a parent. Why? Because death kills the one you love, but divorce, it kills love itself. Despite all that happened, I grew up very close to both my mum and my dad. I love spending time with my dad. So I was devastated when he was diagnosed with cancer. When I was visiting my father in the cancer ward, my mother called to let me know she'd just received a cancer diagnosis of her own. It was aggressive pancreatic cancer. It was just almost too much to take. This is a painting by Phil Mackay, a contemporary Australian artist whose studio is in Port Macquarie. Phil's a good friend, so he painted me praying next to my dad. I love how he portrays Jesus. Jesus is standing tenderly caring for both of us. It's a beautiful image that all of us would want when we're seriously ill. But it's not the whole story. You see, both my mum and dad had terrible prognoses. Both turned to God for a miracle. Both got the best treatment possible. My dad, he lived. The doctors still call him the miracle man. My mum, after six terrible months, she died. No miracle for her. Why? I know mum prayed just as sincerely as dad did. I prayed just as hard for mum as I did for dad. So what went wrong? Why didn't God hear our prayers? Why did he let mum die just a few months after the diagnosis? Dad was healed, but my beautiful, loving mother wasn't. Why? Let's go back to one of the most well-known artists in history so we can explore what their work tells us about the baffling mystery of miracles. You know this fresco as Michelangelo's The Creation of Adam from the Sistine Chapel. It took Michelangelo four years to paint the chapel, but he only spent a few weeks on this section, and yet it's become the most famous portion. What's interesting about this painting is that Michelangelo's depiction is entirely his own creation. There's nowhere in the Bible that describes a scene like this. Maybe that's why Bishop Giovio, when he saw this painting in the 1520s, was so baffled. He said this, among the most important figures is that of an old man who's in the middle of the ceiling who is represented in the act of flying through the air. Now, we, of course, know this old man as Michelangelo's interpretation of God. This outstretched finger is a metaphor for God's immense creative power. We often think of miracles as the dramatic reversal of illness or death. But what this painting expresses is that the very existence of life, that's God's greatest miracle. The point of this painting is simple. God can do anything. He's all-powerful, omnipotent. With a touch or a word, 
life is created. But being omnipotent and choosing to heal people, well, they're two very different things. Let's examine another work for a clue into healing miracles. This piece is by Paolo Veronese. Now, Veronese, he was a real character. He was an Italian painter born in Verona, hence the surname Veronese. He was known as the happy painter. Why? Well, not only because he wore bright clothes and he wore velvet shoes, but also he had an outlook on life that was so positive. He really lived life to the full. And as a result, his paintings nearly always contained action. They had colour and drama. This painting is called Jesus and the Centurion. It was painted by Veronese in 1571, and it tells one of the most inspiring stories in the Bible. I love the bright colours of the costumes against the white background of the architecture. Notice how this centurion is so humble, he's down on his knees with just a young child holding his helmet. Remember, this is a leader of the Roman army, the most powerful army the world had ever known. Kneeling in front of whom? An itinerant preacher from a conquered people who didn't even have his own home. This painting tells the story of healing by Wi-Fi, a miracle through the cloud. Perhaps we could say it's an example of complete systems integration. You see, the centurion told Jesus his servant was paralysed and in great pain. Jesus said, OK, let's go, I'll fix him. But the centurion said, no need. All you need to do, Jesus, is talk and my servant will be healed. In other words, Jesus, you could be anywhere, but I know that if you say, be healed, my servant will be healed. Do you know what Jesus said about this Roman centurion? Jesus said he'd never seen greater faith than the faith this centurion expressed. And of course, the servant was healed at the very instant Jesus said, be healed. The Bible has many stories of healing that happened before and after Jesus came to earth. There are even stories of ancient prophets and early Christians raising the dead. And did you know that Jesus healed more than he preached? There's over 40 specific healings outlined in the Gospels. And the Bible also mentions Jesus healing multitudes, probably thousands. Jesus healed the young and old, men and women, poor and rich, Jews and Gentiles, believers and unbelievers. Clearly, miraculous healing is a part of God's plan. But when and why? I travelled to Fatima in Portugal. Now, this is a famous place where people go to be healed. There were shops selling all sorts of things to help you in the process. For instance, if you have a sore leg, then you can buy a wax leg and burn it as you pray. Here was a foot that I bought. There were even heads for sale. Then I purchased a bottle of holy water. The objective is to sprinkle the area that needs to be healed and then pray. Now, this particular bottle I purchased had a note to say that it's personally guaranteed by the Pope to work or else you get your money back. <laughs> I wonder if anyone's talked to the Pope about that guarantee. But the Bible paints a very different picture of healing. The book of James outlines the process involved in asking God for healing. First, James says, if we need something, we should talk to God about it. He's our father. He cares. We shouldn't hold back. James goes on to say, if any one of you are sick, then call the elders together. It doesn't matter what our illness is, psychological, physical, or spiritual, or a combination of all three. God created us. He knows what makes us tick. And when we come to him, he'll hear us. James also tells us that we should confess our sins to God. 
God is always ready to forgive us and he's always ready to help us forgive others. Then James says something confronting. He says, the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Didn't James know that faithful Christians die? Well, of course he knew. Yes, the Bible contains stories of miracles, but it also contains many stories of tragic deaths, even of faithful people. What James is saying here isn't that prayer will always bring physical healing like a magic charm in the children's novel. Rather, sincere prayer ensures anyone can be saved for eternity. And sometimes it results in a miraculous recovery in this life first, as it did for my father. But why not always? Because if we were always healed, we'd never die. And if we never died, it would put a lie to what God said at the outset of humanity, sin always results in death. It's a cause and effect relationship that's unbreakable. And the Bible doesn't gloss over this confronting fact of life in a sinful world. You see, not everyone in the Bible was healed. In fact, healing is the exception to the rule. Let me illustrate. Here's a painting with the title, The Liberation of St. Peter. This work was painted in 1619 by the Dutch artist Hendrik van Steenvik. It doesn't look a bad jail, does it? This work is now housed in the Royal Collection at Windsor Castle. And as you can see from the painting, this artist loved to paint architecture. Using mathematical formulas to determine the angles, this family were known as masters of perspective. He painted 25 paintings of this story alone. The Bible records the story of an angel who came along and tapped Peter on the shoulder. He loosened his chains and then led him right out the front door. An amazing miracle by any measure. So we might conclude that the Bible is full of great escapes, but there's a problem with that conclusion because just a few verses before this story, the Bible tells us that James, the brother of John, he was also in prison. So what happened to him? Well, the tap on his shoulder was a very, very big tap. In fact, the Bible states that the soldiers chopped James's head right off his shoulders. And according to ancient accounts, Peter himself was crucified by the Romans later in life. Feeling unworthy to die like his Lord, Peter asked to be crucified upside down. James and Peter were not alone. John the Baptist asked for a miracle. Jesus said no. John was a cousin of Jesus. John had even baptised Jesus. And talking of John, Jesus said there was no greater man ever to have lived. And yet Jesus said no miracle for you. When we look at the span of history, we discover healings are quite rare. Even in the Bible, they're exceptionally rare. Daniel, for example, was saved in the lion's den. But many thousands of early Christians died in Roman Colosseums during the Great Persecutions. This is a painting by Jean-Léon Jérôme, a much revered French artist of the mid 1800s. He went out of fashion when Impressionism came into vogue. Jérôme titled this painting, The Christian Martyr's Last Prayer. It took the artist 20 years from the time this painting was commissioned until he delivered it. The central figures are Christians. They're about to be consumed by wild animals for the entertainment of the immense crowd. Already around the edge of the stadium are other Christians who've been covered in pitch. Some have been set alight, while others are awaiting their fate. It's as grim a scene as can be imagined. How many Christians were murdered by the Romans is a subject of debate. But it's a minimum of 10,000 men, women and children. And the number's probably closer to 100,000. The Bible doesn't cover up the lack of miracles. It simply notes when miracles occur and provides an unvarnished account when they don't. And even when miracles do occur, they aren't permanent. Jairus' daughter may have been healed by Jesus, 
but she died eventually, as did the centurion's servant, as did Peter, James and John, and as did Jerome, who was buried under his poignant statue, which was simply titled Sorrow, in Montmartre Cemetery in Paris. The statue? Well, he'd originally cast it to sit over his son's grave, whose premature death caused Jerome immense heartache. So how do we reconcile all this? Amazing miracles. Then mundane tragedies. Striking divine intervention. Then stony heavenly silence. This is what the Bible teaches. The story of everyone in a sinful world is not one of temporal deliverance. Ultimately in this world, there are no permanent miracles. So why do miracles happen at all? To achieve God's will? Well, maybe, but it's not God's will that there's sin, death, suffering, or pain at all. So how does the occasional spectacular intervention come close to achieving God's purpose in an evil world? Miracles don't mean a sinful world operates according to God's purpose. However, they do accomplish something. They point to the unequivocal promise the Bible does give eternal salvation by faith in Jesus. As good as life can be, as happy and fulfilling, as grand and exciting, we're still trapped in a cycle of human tragedy. The miracle stories are footnotes to the overarching human narrative, but they point forward to the reality of the miracle story, the promise of salvation from this cycle of heartbreak. It's the capstone of human history, the promise of all promises, the miracle of all miracles. And how was the promise of salvation made secure? Well, this takes us back to the question that I posed at the beginning. You see, God knows what Jairus felt when his daughter died. He comprehends what I felt when my beautiful mother died so young. He understands Jerome's heartache at the death of his son. How can we know God understands? Because his son Jesus died too. And how he died, why he died, and what his death means gives hope to all of us when we suffer. Before Jesus died, he prayed to God the Father for protection. He didn't want to die any more than you or I want to die. But God the Father did not deliver Jesus. Matthew records Christ's last words before he died as, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's the most chilling, desperate cry of the Son to the Father. Haven't we all felt like bellowing that prayer out to God at some point in life? I certainly did when my parents divorced. I did it all over again when my mother, who I just saw as perfect when she died. Why no miracle for my mother? And yet in the death of Jesus, I find hope, more than hope, the promise of a life in a place where there's no evil, no suffering, no death whatsoever. Here's a painting by James Tussaud. You may know the story. Jesus went to Capernaum and as soon as everyone heard he was in town, well, they flocked to where he was speaking. The place was packed. Meanwhile, there was a man who had paralysis who wanted to see Jesus. In fact, he was so desperate that his friends took him up to the roof and they let him down in front of everyone. Well, you can imagine the stir that that must have caused. I love how the artist has this man with his arms out asking for help, while Jesus has his arms out to give help. But I want you to notice something else. The reason this man was so desperate to see Jesus was not to be healed of his paralysis. That'd be good. But that wasn't his primary objective. This man wanted to be healed of the guilt of his sin. And he was prepared to go to any length to see Jesus. The first words Jesus said weren't, good news, you can walk now. No, the first words were much more profound. Son, your sins are forgiven you. Only after Jesus forgave the man's sin did he continue, I say to you, arise, take up your bed 
and go to your house. One of the key reasons Jesus performed so many miracles was not just because he was compassionate. It was to show he was God, the God of total healing. So powerful, he can even conquer death. But what's the root cause of death? The root cause of death is sin. And here's the main news. Jesus conquered death by conquering sin for all of us. That's why the Bible says that ye may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. So let's finish where we began, with my dad living, but my mum dying. There are many things we can't explain, and that's part of life. But I do know this, God loves us so much that he'll do anything and everything to save us. And nothing, absolutely nothing we suffer is anything he hasn't suffered, both for us and with us. He knows what it's like to die because Jesus died the most awful, humiliating and painful death. God also knows what it's like to have someone I love die because when Jesus was crying out to his father, imagine the pain God the father was feeling. After all, what hurts more, when you're in pain or when the one you love the most is in pain? And there's one more thing. God knows what it's like to look forward to that time when parent and child are together again. Because his son died. His son was in the grave. But just like Jairus' daughter, Jesus rose from the dead and he was reunited with his father. But miracles do have meaning. They point forward to the unequivocal promise God gives, not salvation in this world, but salvation from this world. And when that miracle occurs, I look forward to holding my mum again in a world free of suffering, sickness and death. And when it comes to miracles, well, they don't get any better than that. So why did Jesus raise Jairus' daughter? Well, for one thing, because that miracle gives me confidence that he'll raise my mum too. Not just for this life, but for eternity.